Everything you're about to see in this video is real. The following contains footage that will show the full, brutal reality of modern warfare. Viewer discretion is advised. In today's episode, we're going to take a look at five pieces of footage taken during the Second World War that reveal the horror and tragedy of that great cataclysm of history. It is a raw, unbiased glance into a world which may now be confined to history, but still affects us to this very day. Welcome to Wars of the World. The battles in the sky for bomber crews of World War II were particularly brutal and harsh. In the opening months of America's entry into the war, there were few Allied fighter planes capable of escorting the American bombers all the way to the target and back, meaning they had to fend off German fighters themselves, many of which had longer ranged and harder hitting weapons than the Liberator's 50 cal guns. However, while they could possibly fend off enemy fighters, one threat to the bombers always remained as they approached the target area. In order to drop their bombs, they had to fly through thick anti-aircraft fire known as flak. The term flak is a contraction of the German word Flugabverkannen, but became something of a universal term for anti-aircraft guns in all theaters of the war. On May 4th, 1945, a B-24 took off from an airfield on Palau Island in the West Pacific to participate in a raid against anti-aircraft defenses on Karor Island with other B-24s of the US 7th Air Force. This B-24, which had been christened Brief by its 10-man crew, was piloted by 2nd Lieutenant Glenn R. Cluster and his co-pilot, 2nd Lieutenant Irving R. Brown. Aboard another B-24 in the formation was an army cameraman who was to record footage of the operation for public relations purposes, such as encouraging the purchase of war bonds. However, no one could have foreseen the dramatic and harrowing footage that would be recorded that day. Over the target, the formation took heavy enemy fire as they began dropping their destructive bomb load onto Japanese positions. As the camera is pointed in the direction of Lieutenant Cluster's aircraft, recording the bombs falling from the bomb bay, the B-24 takes a direct hit in the wing between the number two engine and the fuselage. This hit is fatal. The wing breaks off from the aircraft, folding upwards, sending the rest of the aircraft into a downward spiral before crashing into the waters around Karor Island at approximately 10.37 AM with the whole terrible episode captured on film. One can only imagine the terror experienced by those men on board as the aircraft tumbled from the sky. The B-24 interior was cramped and difficult to traverse even at the best of times, but while fighting against the G-forces produced by the aircraft's death dive, it is nigh impossible to escape before the inevitable crash into the sea. Only one of 10 men succeeded in escaping the doomed bomber, Navigator 2nd Lieutenant Wallace F. Kaufman. However, the tragedy of this story does not end here. Kaufman was almost immediately captured upon landing in his parachute by the Japanese troops he and his comrades had only just finished dropping bombs on. The Japanese were of course notorious for their poor treatment of prisoners, but for aircraft, they seemed especially vicious. After being held for 20 days in appalling conditions where he was at the mercy of his Japanese guards, on May 24th, 1945, he was executed by one Lieutenant Katsuyama, who would recount this incident in detail when interviewed after the war. Back home in the United States, the footage of the B-24 being shot down was shown in movie theaters across the country, with the narrator declaring that the war in the Pacific was not cheap in reference to the deaths of the crew of the Liberator. 
The footage, however, proved controversial for several reasons. Initially, there was anger that the families of the men themselves could literally be allowed to see their deaths, while on a wider scale, the families of countless bomber crews still carrying out their campaign against Japan were no doubt traumatized by the footage, seeing just what could happen to their husbands, sons, and brothers. However, the footage would also come under scrutiny for just what it claims to show. The War Department reported that the bomber was hit by anti-aircraft fire, but some who viewed it couldn't help but notice that it was hit whilst unloading its bombs. This led them to the conclusion that the aircraft was in fact hit by a falling bomb from another Liberator. Such incidents were not uncommon, given the sheer scale of the Allied bombing campaign, which, at times, included over a thousand aircraft dropping bombs together. But the authorities insisted this was not the case. It would seem that, in this instance, they were correct as a careful frame-by-frame -frame examination proves that the aircraft was hit by anti-aircraft fire and not a falling Allied bomb. As it stands, the footage remains a testament to the dangers Allied bomber crews faced every day in the service of their country. Fire. It has been a key component of warfare throughout history, and harnessing its power as a tool with which to defeat the enemy has long been a goal of rulers and leaders. But like so many weapons, it was not until the industrial age with the application of the sciences that such weapons became a reality. Flamethrowers had existed in various forms before 1914, but they matured to be a credible weapon system during the First World War where they proved devastatingly effective at clearing out trenches of enemy troops. During World War II, flamethrowers were again thrust into the battle to clear away enemy fortifications, and they were especially important during the island hopping campaigns in the Pacific. Here, Japanese forces were entrenched in bunkers and hideouts, concealed by the dense jungles, allowing them to remain hidden from view ready to conduct ambushes, as well as affording them protection from grenades and artillery shells nearby. Flamethrowers therefore became the preferred weapon clearing such defensive positions, as well, of course, as for burning the enemy alive. They also superheated the caves and tunnels where enemy troops were hiding, causing those inside to pass out. Additionally, they started fires that filled the hideouts with choking smoke or consumed all the oxygen inside, Either way, suffocating the Japanese troops occupying them. As such, the flamethrower was one of the most feared weapons employed by all sides during the war. By early 1945, the Japanese had been pushed back across the Pacific, but with every mile they were forced to retreat, the greater their desperation became to hold off the Allies and protect their home islands. Located 750 miles off the coast of Japan, the island of Iwo Jima had three airfields that could serve as a staging facility for a potential invasion of mainland Japan, and on February 19th, 1945, American forces invaded. The Battle of Iwo Jima lasted for five weeks and would see some of the bloodiest fighting of the entire war. Up to 21,000 Japanese forces were dug in and they made the 70,000 plus US Marines fight for every square inch. This footage was recorded by American forces as they fought to clear the Japanese positions on the islands. Flamethrower troops and tanks were shown at the forefront of the effort, for, as the narrator explains, where we can't dig them out, we burn them out. The footage clearly demonstrates the effectiveness of the flamethrower in combat and how it can clear a wide area so quickly. At the same time, it also helps to show the terror such weapons can instill upon an enemy force seeing men and machines spitting fire like the dragons of mythology. By the end of the campaign, the 21,000 Japanese defenders had been whittled down to just 200. It has been said, accurately, I should imagine, that being burned alive is probably one of the most excruciating deaths imaginable, as the flesh is melted away and the nerve endings are destroyed. Being hit by a flamethrower 
It is likely that you would swallow the burning liquid, thus incinerating your insides even before the external fire reached them. The fire would also cause your soft tissues to contract, causing your weakened skin to tear, and the fat, muscles, and even organs to shrink. The muscles then contract due to the burning, and this causes the joints to flex, leaving your body contorted into what's known as a pugilistic or boxer pose, as was the case with many of the victims of the Pompeii volcanic eruption in 79 AD. Given the horror of such a death and seeing it inflicted on their comrades, it is little wonder therefore that the flamethrower operators and tank crews that were captured on all fronts were often subjected to the most hellish and brutal treatment. Even on the Western European front, where prisoners were generally treated better than elsewhere, flamethrower crews would abandon their equipment before having to surrender, instead claiming to have lost their rifles during battle. It has become one of the most legendary showdowns in naval history. On May 19th, 1941, one of Germany's mightiest battleships, the 50,000 ton Bismarck, under the command of Vice Admiral Gunther Lutjens, ventured out to sea alongside the Prinz Eugen with the aim to decimate the vital Allied convoys coming across the North Atlantic from Canada. For the Royal Navy Admiralty, Bismarck was a very real threat to the war effort. Lutjens had already commanded a similar operation using the German capital ship Scharnhorst, achieving great success, and now he had even more firepower at his command. Thus, on Churchill's insistence, the order went out to sink the Bismarck. Having operated in the Baltic Sea, the Royal Navy knew the German ships would have to pass between Greenland, Iceland, and Scotland to reach the convoys, and so positioned a force of warships to patrol these areas. Among their number was the battle cruiser HMS Hood, known colloquially to the British people as the Mighty Ud. A remarkably handsome ship, HMS Hood had captured the hearts of the British people during the interwar years, building up a myth of the vessel's invincibility. This was terrific for British propaganda at a time when the German war machine appeared unstoppable, but to those who understood warship design and operational concepts, Hood was known to have several key defects that had led many in the Admiralty concerned should it come up against the Bismarck. Nevertheless, Hood, along with the recently built battleship Prince of Wales, patrolled west of Iceland as the German warships made their move. On May 24th, the Prince of Wales sighted the two German warships, and at 5.52 am, the first shots were fired. Mistaking Prince Eugen for the Bismarck, the British vessels initially targeted the smaller cruiser first, while the two German ships focused their awesome firepower solely on the hood. This rare footage was taken from the deck of the Prince Eugen and shows the incredible spectacle of Bismarck firing her guns in anger, sending shells out to the British ships some 23 kilometers away when the engagement began. Splashes can also be seen in the water as British shells fall short of their target. However, early into the fight, HMS Hood suffered a hit from Prince Eugen, which started a fire amidships that began to rapidly spread. As the mighty warship took more and more strikes from the two German capital ships, the death blow came at around 6 am, when one of Bismarck's shells penetrated one of the Hood's magazine stores. In the resulting explosion, the back of the battlecruiser was broken, and the mighty Hood sank within minutes, taking all but three of the 1,417 men on board with it. HMS Prince of Wales tried to continue the fight, but was now totally outgunned by the Germans, and badly beaten, made a hasty retreat. The destruction of such an iconic British warship in such a short time struck deep at the hearts of the British people, and made many believe that the Bismarck was an unstoppable killing machine. However, 
Keen to avenge their fallen comrades aboard the Hut, the Royal Navy and Air Force launched a massive effort to chase down the Bismarck. Having located the German warship, wave after wave of Royal Navy swordfish torpedo planes were sent in to attack, but they found little success given the Bismarck's underwater protection. Then one torpedo managed to damage the battleship's steering mechanism, rendering the ship unmaneuverable. As efforts were underway to repair it, the British seized the opportunity and closed in with everything they had, raking the battleship with gunfire until her 15-inch guns, the very guns that had sent the hood to the bottom of the sea, were destroyed and Luchens was dead. Even so, the incredible warship refused to sink, and it wouldn't be until the German crew, realizing their situation was hopeless, detonated charges in the hull and sent the mighty ship down, scuttling what was until that point, the most feared warship in the world. The Bismarck sank just three days after her battle with the Hood. At first, this short clip may appear to be just another gun camera video of the last moments of a Japanese bomber as it falls to the guns of an American fighter. Dramatic, certainly, but by no means unique. However, look again. Under the fuselage of this Mitsubishi G4M bomber, codenamed Betty by the Allies, there is a small bulge which appears to have its own set of wings. This is no ordinary Betty bomber. It is in fact a carrier plane for the Yokosuka MXY-7 Okam missile, a devastating weapon with blistering speed designed to punch through Allied fighter patrols and strike at Allied fleets that were, by 1945, encircling the Japanese home islands. What made the weapon so effective was its guidance system, namely, a human pilot on a one-way mission in a desperate effort to turn the tide of the war back in Japan's favor. The Oka was perhaps the ultimate kamikaze. Had this particular aircraft not been intercepted before it could deploy its Oka, then once in range of an allied warship, the Oka would be released and the pilot would glide towards the target. Upon sighting it, he would fire the three solid fuel rockets, either one at a time or in unison, and then guide the missile with its 1300 pounds of high explosive towards the ship he intended to destroy. Achieving speeds of some 620 miles per hour during the dive at the end of the flight, the Oka pilot would be almost impossible for Allied fighter pilots to intercept, and it would be down to the Allied fleet's anti-aircraft gunners to hopefully score a lucky hit before the human-guided missile hit home. The introduction of the Oka in October of 1944 terrified Allied fleet commanders, who realized that the only effective way to stop them was to extend fighter pilot patrols further out from the fleet in an attempt to destroy them while still clinging underneath their lumbering carrier bombers. Yet despite the fear the weapon instilled in Allied sailors, and tragically for the brave men who volunteered to throw their lives away by guiding the missiles to their targets, post-war assessment of the Oka's impact on the war is rather unfavorable. It did not even contribute to a slowing of the Allied advance on Japan. Allied fighter cover was so dense and their pilots so well trained in combating Japanese aircraft that the majority of Okas were destroyed while still clinging under their carrier aircraft. Yet, Japan never seemed short of volunteers to become kamikazes, even when it was obvious the war was all but lost. As a result, American pilots and sailors nicknamed the Oka pilot Bakas, a word which roughly translates into Japanese as fool. The Massacre of Innocents in War is as old and terrible as war itself. Equally, it has always been just as easy as it is today to turn a blind eye to the suffering of others when it happens thousands of miles away from your everyday life. 
However, the advent of camera technology ushered in an age where we could all be potential witnesses to the darkest chapters of history. The Nazis were never shy about recording their atrocities. In fact, they kept meticulous records of their extermination of so-called inferior races within the occupied lands of Europe, and these included photographic and video evidence. As such, the Holocaust in Europe, its images of cattle cars, gas chambers, and starved masses have all become ingrained on the minds of the post-war generations. Given how familiar we have become with such scenes, then you may be forgiven for thinking you are looking at the roundup of Jewish people here, but you would be wrong. These people are being led to their deaths, but they are not Jewish. They are not Romani peoples, nor are they Jehovah's Witnesses, or anyone you might expect. No, these are German civilians living within the border of Czechoslovakia after the country had been freed by the Red Army. This footage emerged in 2010 and was taken on May 10th, 1945, less than 48 hours after the surrender of Nazi Germany when the war in Europe ended. The footage shows men, women, and children of German ethnicity in Boris Slavka, a district of Prague being rounded up and led away as part of the forced expulsions that were taking place at the time. Some three million ethnic Germans would be forcibly expelled from Czechoslovakia, with some of the most brutal acts of violence being carried out against anyone who refused. From the group in this film, a number are singled out and made to stand along the roadside with a picturesque meadow behind them. They likely already know they will soon be shot by men wearing white armbands. These men were the Czechoslovakia Revolutionary Guards, a vigilante group who took to purging the country of the German people once and for all. Approximately 40 men and one woman are believed to have been shot at this scene. As if their lives were not worthless enough to their killers, their bodies were then desecrated by trucks driving over them. Scenes such as this took place all across Czechoslovakia during the expulsions from the country, either through official policy or so-called wild expulsions by armed groups, such as the Revolutionary Guards. It continues to be unclear just how many died during the expulsions, with estimates ranging from 20,000 to a quarter of a million. Many of those who died starved in holding areas where the conditions were extremely poor, and in many cases, their guards were freed concentration camp prisoners who reveled in tormenting the people they blamed for their own suffering, regardless of whether they were Nazis or not. There was no trial. People, old and young, were simply singled out and murdered. You are not seeing justice for a people previously oppressed, here, you see the only thing that flourishes in war. Raw, unbridled hatred. The very worst of mankind. And there you have the horror of World War II in film. I can assure you that you are not alone if you found this difficult to watch, but it is necessary to understand truly just how terrible war is. Far from the Hollywood splendor and the political pandering, war is hell, and we must remember this as we move forward and seek to never again repeat the mistakes of our past. Thank you for watching. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and reactions, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. This is Wars of the World.